Um, have you ever come home late from hanging with friends, past your curfew, and your parents, if not both, or one of them were sitting on the couch and they were like, they wanted to like chew you out when you got in? Anybody ever did that? Like I know some of us are older now, but when you were younger, did you ever come home late and your parents were like sitting there like waiting on you? And maybe they were asleep. So the next morning when you got up before you left your room, you felt like the animosity in the house. Like you knew as soon as you left out of your room, you were going to be hit with questions and, and your punishment. Anybody ever felt that way? Maybe not too many of y'all, but when I was younger, my grandmother used to have all types of figurines in her house and little fixtures, and my brothers and I were wild. And so we would run through her house and we would break so many things. But before she got home from the store, we would find glue and different stuff to put it back together so that she couldn't see it. But my grandmother knew every inch of her house. And so when she got home, she saw it. And the next day when we came, she was waiting on us with the rod of correction. <laughs> the belt, like the switch, like ready to get us, ready to get us. The good news today is that we're going to be talking about a story with the same type of action, but a different type of response. For the last two weeks, we've been in this series, Love Like God Does, and we've had an amazing journey of walking through how God, um, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and today, the lost son. How many of you guys ever heard that story about the prodigal son? Everybody, right? Everybody that's a believer has heard that story. But today, if you would just lend me your ear and your heart today, I want to not give you a new way of looking at that, but a fresh way of looking at that. Just a fresh way, right? And I believe that God has revealed to me something fresh in this as we close out this series regarding the lost son. <clears throat> like I said already, the story of the prodigal son is very familiar to so many believers. Uh, but we want to just dig a little deeper into that today. So we'll go to that first slide, and it says... We're reading from the Passion Translation today. Luke 15, 11 through 12 says, Then Jesus said, Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me my share of your estate? So the father went ahead and distributed between the two sons their inheritance. You can stay right there. The man in this story was a Jewish father. And if you know anything about Jewish custom, uh, for his sons to come, and come to him and say, can you give me my share of the estate? Basically, he's telling his father, you are dead to me, and I want what belongs to me so that I can go and do whatever I want to do with him. And this father in this story, what we find is that he's not, a loving, he's not just a loving father, but he's not a controlling father. He is a loving father, not a controlling father. You cannot be both loving and controlling. Do you agree with me? You can't be both loving and controlling. Um, I would be remorsed if I was in my marriage with my wife and I loved her and I expressed my love to her, but on the back side of it, I told her how to express her love to me, right? In the holy marriage, God desires for us to be, which the holy marriage is a perfect picture of God and the way he loves the church. He expects us as husbands to be that way to our wives. There's not a time where God tells us how to respond, but he gives the way free. He says, this morning, we had a free altar to respond the way we wanted to respond to God. He says, not tell us how because he's not a controlling God, but he is a loving God. Can we just thank God for being loving? Thank you, Jesus, for being loving God. I thank you that you give us free will. And that's what the loving father did here. Scripture does not say that he argued back and forth with his son. It does not say that, right? But what it says, what he divided up the inheritance and he gave it to his sons. A beautiful picture of God's love for the church, I believe. The next scripture goes on, verse 14. It says, we, we skip verse 13, but thir verse 13 just explains how the son took his inheritance and went to a foreign land and started to, to splurge all of his money, right? He just started to splurge all of his inheritance. Verse 14 says, with everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry because there was a, a severe famine in the land. So he begged a farmer in the country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing even to eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him anything. The son has run so far away from home that no one even knows, I'd imagine that his father had land, and no one even knows him. There are certain places, I'm going to take these glasses off because they are new, 
and uh, I can't see that one. <laughs> so I'm going to take those off. I just got them Friday. Uh, but the sun is so far away from home that nobody knows them. We live in, Gas- we live in uh, Marion, and some of you live in Gas City. Some of you live in other towns around the area. I'm from Mississippi, and there, is not, there aren't many places that I can go in Mississippi where nobody knows me. Like, there, there are not many places. And even if I do go somewhere where nobody knows me, somebody usually knows my family or someone like that. This guy was so far away from his homeland that no one knew him. Like, so he had no, nobody could come up and say, oh, I know your parents, let me get you something to eat. <laughs> it wasn't happening for him in this area. Like, I, even now, there are places in Columbus, Ohio, there are places here, even in Marion, I've made so many great relationships where I know that if I was stranded on the side of the road, someone would help me. But this guy was so far away from home that no one even knew who he was. And he had to beg for a job and beg for something to eat, right? Have you ever gotten to that point where you're like stranded somewhere and you, you have no, like no resources around you, but you're waiting on someone to just pop up and show up? Yeah. Like you're waiting on someone to just pop up and show up? I imagine that's how he felt. Like I'm so far away from home. And in our, in our day's term, like my, my cell phone has died. <laughs> I have no GPS. My tires are flat. This car won't crank. Uh, I didn't charge it enough because it's a new electric car. And uh, I cannot go anywhere. Like, I'm stuck where I am. That's what I imagine his circumstance was. The next verse says in 17, it says, Humiliated, the son finally realized what he was doing. And he thought, there are many workers in my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to share. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs, eating their slop? I want to go back to my father's house, and I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Father, please forgive me, or please, Father, treat me like one of your employees. The younger son had really come to his senses. He'd come to the end of himself, and he was suffering from a result of a decision that he had made to leave home and get all of his inheritance, so he was suffering from that. However, what he does here is not really a repentance speech. He comes to his senses. Like, he, come, he, he reminds me a lot of David when David says in Psalms 84 and 10, it says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tent of wickedness. I, that reminds me that in the presence of God, there is everything that I need in the house of God. I think this son comes to a point of him even wanting to go to a place of worship and say, God, I know that if I can get into your presence, I have everything that I need. Have you ever been in a place like that where you're like, I, I don't have everything that I need here, but I know that if I can get to the presence of God, whether that's in my prayer closet, whether that's in the church on Sunday morning, that, whether that's in the fellowship of other brothers and sisters, if I can get in the presence of God, I'll have the things that I need. This young man knew that at his father's house, he would have all of the supplies, all the food, and even if he was just an employee or a servant in his father's house, he'd have access to the things that his father had. Like, like that's a realization, right? I realize that my father's house has everything that I need. The son knows that the father's house has everything, everything, everything that he needs. That next slide says that the son knows that the father's house has everything that he needs. He truly comes to his senses. And and again, again, we said that there's something about the presence of God that is so satisfying that you want to give more of yourself to the presence of God. Psalms 84 is a beautiful explanation of the worshiper's heart. He says in verse 19, I'll never again be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. God is not into hiring employees, but God is into adopting sons and daughters. He's not into hiring servants and employees, but he's hiring sons and daughters. The Word of God says that the whole earth and the creation awaits the adoption of sons. It does not await the adoption of miracles because miracles and blessings are byproduct of being a son and a daughter of God, right? That's going to happen anyway. 
but the whole earth and creation waits for the adoption of sons, for sons and daughters to come into an awareness that, God, I'm not an orphan anymore. I've been bought with a price, right? God paid the biggest price that anyone could ever pray for anything for me. You all remember a couple of Sundays ago, Pastor Dave was talking about that hat that he bought, um, Savannah, at camp, and how much money he spent on it? Imagine that God spending all that he had saved up, all that he has just for you, sending his only begotten son just for you. What a testimony of his goodness, right? He paid a price that we could never pay for us, right? I thank you, Jesus, that you see worth in me. I thank you, God, that you saw worth in me, even when I didn't see it in myself, right? Because sometimes we, we feel so self-worthless, but God is saying, you are a son, you are a daughter, you're not an employee, you don't have to clock in and clock out, you're already a part of this family, you have a seat at the table, come in and take rest in my presence. God does not cancel us out of the family, no matter what you do, God has not stopped loving you. Even this lost son, we'll find here in a couple minutes, that he was still considered to be a son, even though he was lost. I want to prophesy to you today, even you may have family members that are not here or not present in your life or not present in the Holy Spirit like you are, know that they may be lost, but they're still considered a son. They're still a daughter. And God has not stopped going after them, and so should you stop, not stop going after them. You don't have to call them every day, but even in prayer, remembering those that may be lost, because God is still after those people. He says, I'm long-suffering. I'm willing that no one should perish, but all should have everlasting life. There's nothing that you can do willingly or unwillingly that can undo the adoption plan that God signed off with his blood. He signed off with his blood, right? I've gotten blood stains in shirts before, and I hadn't really found a way to get them out. Maybe you have, and if you have, you can share that with me after service. But I haven't found a way to get those out. His blood has been signed. And the amazing thing about his blood, the Bible declares that it washes us white as snow. Like, like what something so, so, so messy can come in and make something so dirty so clean. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The next part of the story is something that really changed my life, and that's kind of what I'm get, trying to get to because it's a part that has really changed and challenged my life to know that I am a son and that there is lavish love waiting on me and waiting on you too. The Bible says, so the young son set off for home from a long distance away. His father saw him coming dressed as a beggar and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son whom was returning home. The father raced out to meet him, swept him up in his arms. The Passion Translation says, he hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with tender love. The father ran out to his son to meet him. This man, again, we've already talked about it, he was a Jewish father. He was a Jewish man. So he would have had on some type of long apparel, maybe, a, maybe a, some people call it a dress, it's a robe or something like that, something he, he, he's, he's, he's dressed in his priestly attire or his great attire. And so he takes this, and, and if he's going to run, he has to pull this up maybe by his knees to run, right? To even get any type of distance out of the way as, as he runs. And so this, he, he becomes undignified. What a beautiful picture of how Jesus takes our shame and our sin, and he took it on the cross, right? Because Jesus was there, I'd imagine not many garments were on Jesus. We've seen the pictures, we've read the stories about Jesus, and we know that there weren't many garments on him, but he took all of our shame. Not only was he beaten, but he was revealed to the whole world that day on the cross, just for you and I. Just for you and I now. Just for you and I, for the whole entire world, but for you and I. A special love that he has. What a beautiful picture of how he doesn't care about being shamed. Don't we? We care about being shamed. We care about knowing and being connected to people that, 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 that have shame attached to their lives. And we're going to get to that here in just a second. But this father, the, the word runs means to rush or to outrun. Can you go to that next slide? It means to rush or to outrun. To rush or to outrun. What was this father rushing or outrunning? What was he outrunning? 
The Bible says in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, it says, if someone has a stubborn son, a stubborn or rebellious son who does not obey his father and his and mother and will not listen to them and their discipline. His father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of the town. Go to the next one. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then the men of the town, of his town, are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel hear of it and be afraid. Under the law, if a mother and a father had a son that was rebellious, they would take that son to the elders of the city, and they would decide to stone this son. I imagine that this son on his way home was encountered by elders and people in the town that were like, that's the kid that ran away from home. He's the rebellious one. Let's get him. Let's get him. Let's get him. And compassion filled his father's heart. He's like, they can't get to my son because if they get to him, they're going to kill him. They're going to destroy him. How many times do we destroy people with our words? With our words. And God is raising a church like New Life here that are going to be like the father that says, I'm going to run to that kid out there in that street because there are people around in this community that want to eat him up. Like he's a little fish in a pond, but I'm going to him because I know he's done wrong, but I want to lavish him. If he can remember his identity, if he can remember who God calls him, and if we can be the people to run to people and say, God has called you a son and a daughter, not an orphan, not a whatever you've been before, but you have been bought with a price and your life has been changed. Like what type of effect will we have in the world if that was who we were called, if that, if that was what we've done in the world, right? Like if we went to people before the elders got to them or before the outcasts and everybody else in the city got to them and started telling them what they used to be or how they used to act, if that was our, our vision and our goal and the things that we were out after, going to people and making sure they know that they're loved by God, how many more lives would be changed? Like they're not, they're, they're kind of get to us, but guess what? Some people can't even make it to the house of God because of the accusations. Some people can't even make it to this church because of the shame and because people are just talking down on them. We've got to be the ones to go to them. There are people that will never step in new life. There are people that are not coming here, and we're expecting them. We're waiting on them. Yes, we're setting up count for them to be ready for them when they come, but we've got to be like this father to go out and get them, right? We've got to go out and get them. We've got to put on our, take up, take up our, our, our garments, and some of us have to take off some of these jackets, some of these shirts, some of these things that are weighing us down and say, I'm going to get to the lost son. I want to get to the lost son. I'd imagine that this father was saying, if they get to him, they're going to kill him. And I can't afford to let this happen to my son because he is loved and there's a house waiting on him. There's a home waiting on him. There's a home waiting on him. The loving father had a different response. Just as the son is walking and journeying home, he runs to him and he kisses him. He runs to him. This is before the son, like he kisses him. He's like, oh, I love you. I love you. Welcome home. Before the son even gets a chance to say his repentance speech, right? He, had, he got a speech prepared. He has a speech prepared. The Bible says in verse 21, then the son said, father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. I could never be deserved to call to be called your son. Just let me be. I'd imagine that the father just cut him off at B. <laughs> just let me be. We know that this son had a son had a, had a speech prepared because the, the verses before says he came to his senses and he prepared a speech. But what if he? Do you know if he really had the guts to really say his speech? Like, don't we come sometimes on Sunday mornings like, I'm going to go and I'm going to just repent to God. I'm going to just tell him all the things. Or not even Sunday morning, during the week, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to just go to Jesus and just repent. And the beautiful things is he arrests us in love before we can even get to our speech. He arrests us in love before we can even get to our speech. 
The Word of God says, so this, this lets me know that it is not our repentance that brings us to the goodness of God, but the Word of God says it is the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. It is actually the goodness of God that has led me to repentance. It wasn't nothing good that I did. It wasn't my mom. It wasn't my sister. It wasn't my brother. It was actually God watching out for me all of those years that I've been stupid and saying, you're a son. I love you. And then I was, I, I was bathed in repentance. I'm like, this is my, my posture now. How could I not say, Lord, I'm sorry and I love you because you've loved me so, like so well. We don't, we don't get to, we don't serve a God that is like uh, our get out of jail free card. Y'all ever seen that on, uh, um, on the Monopoly game? Like get out of jail free. We don't serve that type of God. We serve a God that says, welcome home, let's rejoice. You're a son, you're a daughter. Here's a robe, here's a ring. Have a seat. What do you want to eat? <laughs> like, seriously, you get to choose. We don't serve a God that says, get saved and you go to heaven. And that's the type of religion that people are, are just settling for. Yeah. That's not what God has called us to do. He's not called us to come to church and just settle for, I'm saved, now I'm going to heaven whenever he comes back. He called us to come, yes, get saved, desire heaven, but you can make heaven on earth. Matthew 16, let it be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Like, bring it here, God. I want all that you have. I want to live in your house. I want to live in your goodness here on earth. I'm not waiting to heaven, y'all, to live in his goodness. I'm not waiting to heaven to rejoice. That's why on Sunday mornings when you see me on stage, I'm not waiting to rejoice. Because if I rejoice here even more in heaven, that's just going to set the expectation even just a little bit higher, right? So we get an opportunity here to love people. We get an opportunity here to love God, to embrace his goodness. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven, right? Tell your neighbor, I don't have to wait till I get to heaven. Don't have to wait. <laughs> this story teaches us something profound that God thinks about us. Our separation from him hurts him way more than sin. I believe that. Our separation from him. In the book of Genesis, and this just came to me, um, when God told Adam and Eve not to partake of the fruit, it wasn't because he didn't want them to sin. It was because he didn't want them to be separated from him. He does not want us to be separated from him. He wants us to live in his presence. He wants his presence to be a place where you can come and just sit and just be and just be in his presence. That doesn't mean that I got to spend 24 hours a day sitting at home with my worship music on and praying and nobody can get to me. That does not mean that. And there's this, re, there's this uh, new age thinking that means if I'm going to be in the presence of God, then I have to be locked up in a room. That's not what God is calling us to. But God is calling us to spend time with him and go and spend time with others and to share his love. I cannot share the Lord's love if I'm locked up in a closet all day. I can't. People may walk past the room and just feel the anointing in the room, but <laughs> I can't share his love if I'm not getting up and going to people, right? I got to do that. I got to get up and go to people. Yes, his sins does, our sins do hurt him. But I believe that he wants to be so close to us. He teaches us through this picture that of a running God. He's running to his son. He longs for more than anything to be close to us. He wants to be near us. He wants you home where you belong. And when you finally return to his joy, when you finally return to his home and to everything that's around him, Pastor Rachel said it best. Pastor David said it even better. He rejoices. All of heaven rejoices. All of heaven rejoices. Right? All of heaven rejoices for you. Right? Like, all of heaven throws a party for you, Eddie. Like, isn't that wild? Like, I've had a party before. My wife threw me a party last year, amazing party, had some friends come. Some people didn't come. Broke my heart, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> some people didn't come. It was cool though, but this party, 
God invites everybody to come rejoice. Yes, he, he tells all of his employees, all the servants, this father does at the house, you don't have to work for today. Just prepare this meal. We're about to rejoice together. Yeah. Like that's lavish love, right? Verse 22 says, turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me my best robe, the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring me the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger and bring me out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For my beloved son was once dead, but now he is alive. Once he was lost, but now he's found. And everyone celebrated with overwhelming joy. The father can completely ignores his son's request to hire him as a hired hand. <laughs> Have you ever, like, like, walked away from God or wandered off into something that you had no business wandering into? And you came back to God and you're like, God, I love you, I love you, and I'm sorry. And I know that I'm, I probably won't... I'll put myself in my shoes. I know I probably won't be a great worship pastor anymore, but if you could just make me a good musician, I'll be fine with that. If you can make me a good singer, I'll be fine with that. I know I may not be able to sit at the table with you, but just let me be in the room. And God says, no, there's still a seat with your name on it. There's still a plate setting for you. I still want my body and my blood to be a part. Here's the bread, break it. Here's the wine, drink it. Have me. You can have me. Don't separate yourself from me. This father rejoices with overwhelming joy. The moment in this story gives us the beautiful description of the grace of God in the Bible. Like, because he hugs us. <laughs> he gives us his robe. Like, even the rebellious son, right? The one that is rebellious. He says, I still love you. God deals with sin. And I think what we, what, we, what we don't understand a lot of times is that God is going to deal with sin. He's going to deal with all sin at the final judgment. And he's dealing with it now, even in our lives, in the world. He's judging us. We're being judged as a world. Things are happening that have never happened before. God is sending his wrath and his judgment. Yes, he's going to do that. But he longs more to love us than he does to judge us. He longs more to love us. And if we can get an understanding of that, we'll fall so in love with God that we won't even have to be judged. He's coming back for a spotless and blameless church. And I believe that God is still raising that church. He is still raising that church through prayer and fellowship with God and loving others. He is still raising that church. You might be thinking, who is this father? This father is God. Th this, this story has been told like the lost son, the prodigal son. Th the prodigal in this story is really God. And I'll explain to you why. We've, we've looked at that word prodigal and we're like, oh, that means lost. That means messed up son. But the word prodigal means spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. The son spent all of his money, he was done. God doesn't run out of love. And still he spends it freely and extravagantly, right? He's the real prodigal here, right? God is the real prodigal here in this story. What would happen if a generation of mothers and fathers would arise and being, to begin to call their sons and daughters into their identity? rather than just telling them what you've done wrong and deciding that we're going to love without, with limitations. What if we as a church and the people decided that we are going to love without limitations? What if we decided that? As I prepare to close today, um, Sean and I have been on an amazing journey of, of ministry for about three years now. It's been amazing, and we've met some people who have been very... Uh, influential in our lives who've had some amazing journey with God like some history with God uh, last year we were serving at Bethel Cleveland Church and we got a chance this Sunday not like a regular Sunday we didn't have to sing we didn't have to be part of any ministry team but we got a chance to sit in the service and that particular day uh, the preacher by the name of Chris Gore who is the who was the former 
healing pastor at Bethel Reading, he came and shared a message. And after his message, uh, he signed and autographed the book for Sean and I. It was an amazing time. But the book became very uh, just transforming for our lives. We got a chance to read the book, and it talked about the grace of God, talked about knowing your identity in God. And in the story, in the book, he talks about a time when he had his first daughter, and they had their first daughter, and a few months after she was born, they sat with a world-class neurologist, and the neurologist sat with them and told them that their daughter uh, would never be able to talk or walk or speak or do anything for herself. In that moment, he mentions that when he looks at his wife's eyes and looks into his daughter's eyes, his own flesh and blood, he says, it doesn't matter if she's able to ever speak or say anything that will not change my love for her. Today, Charlotte is about 20 years old, but she still doesn't speak. Now she's able to say Papa. Now she's able to say Papa. And her father loves her. Some people will never be able to get out their repentance speech. Some people will never be able to tell Jesus the way we tell him how they love him. Some people feel like they messed up so bad to where they cannot come in here. And God sometimes is just waiting on those people to just say Papa or Daddy. Or even if they can't say it. I love you. Regardless. This is not a message about conversion. This is not the message about uh, believing in God. This is a message about receiving the love of God and showing the love of God. I don't think we understand how serious this series has been. And I'm grateful that Pastor David would allow me to be a part of this series. Love like God does. The only way we can love like God does is to be with him so that he can show us how he loves. Savannah reminds me so much of her father, but she's been with her father. Hopefully my son reminds me much of me because he'll get a chance to spend time with me. Hopefully you remind people of God because you spend time with him. He has called us to a life that is bent towards his love. And if we can share that love, I'm confident that we can win the world. He called us to this amazing journey with him. Amazing journey with him. Today the prayer is that you would be reminded in prayer that I am a son, a daughter, and I have have been lavished with love. Show me how to lavish love with others. Remind me that God's home is my home. And that his presence is a gift. Can we pray that God remind us today, glory to Jesus, that your presence is our home. It is a gift, and you've invited us to that, Jesus. Remind us today that you will lavish us in love, and that you want to lavish even the lowest of the low that we can think of a person. You want to lavish them in love and remind us today that we are sons and daughters. The challenge today. You can go to the next slide. The challenge questions or the conversation questions would be, what made you come back home to God? What made you never wander away from him if you've never wandered away? Um, Who? Who do you know that may have wandered away from God's love? How? How can you remind them that God's love, that God loves them and wants them back home? I think there was a challenge as well. Is there? Sweet. The challenge is to respond with a prodigal love to others, like lavishly, like 
this week, respond to somebody with some lavish, lavish love. Uh, go the extra mile to show love. Reach out to someone who may have wandered away from God's love and remind them that God loves them and wants them back home. Can we sing a song together?